At Category 5 TV, we trust our files to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Whether for your server, laptop, or desktop computer, you'll experience improved performance and reliability. Kingston is with you. Get ready, it's time for the tech. Welcome to the show, everybody. So nice to have you here. My name is Robbie, and joining me today, Jeff Weston. Yo, I'm back. He's back. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good. It's been three weeks. Feels like it's been forever. Isn't that unreal? Time flies. I know. Man. Well, you know, we're, we're out for the first week while you do production, yep. and then Henry was in last week, and now I'm back. And so it's like, yes. oh, I, I got to so catch it up to do. Three weeks. What have you been up to? Oh my goodness, I've been doing so much. Oh yeah? Uh, very busy with work and, uh, and all the tech side stuff there, but we've done a massive overhaul at our church. Interestingly enough, we're getting, we've got a new soundboard. We've replaced all of our projectors with 75-inch uh, TVs, so we've been running HDMI and Ethernet. 75-inch TVs instead of projectors. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry as much now about things like overhead lights interfering with the projection. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's been uh, a chore and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other than that, how I are you, how are you involved? Just for the sake of the viewers, I know, but you know, how what's your involvement as far as? I stand around and tell them what they're doing wrong. <laughs> you delegate? Uh, no, I. Uh, <laughs> so at the church, I I kind of like head up our AV. Mm -hmm. um, so for the last uh, oh gosh six months, we've been. You know, thanks to COVID, we've been modernizing what we do, and it's no longer just recording. A oh, service. okay. So you're ta taking that time while you can't have a congregation in. Well, we've been back in the building since July. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, but it must be a, a, like a restricted number of yeah. people can be. Yeah, in the, we're limited in the to thirty percent building capacity. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's limited number, but because of that, we we have to do more online streaming. So yeah. we've been modernizing. We've we've upgraded to the four K. We've gotten new computers. Nice. Now we're updating all of our tech inside, and it's like, whew, there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. How's the internet? <laughs> uh, the internet is still very very uh, choppy at best. Yeah. Uh, we're out in the middle of a cornfield, and so. You've got LTE, and that's it. That's it. Unless you want, oh. uh, I think, two megs Starlink. down. <laughs> Do you want Starlink? St you know what? Starlink would give us good... Are you on the list? Did uh, you join? I'm not on the list. Starlink.com, Jeff. I should get on the list. Just pop your name in there, and when Elon comes across it, he'll, he'll send you an email. I'll just, I'll just tweet him. Just be like, yo. Just, yeah, I'm sure you'll get his attention. Hook, hook the cornfield up, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, seriously, people yeah. can, you can sign up on Starlink.com for um, the beta. Right. And as it works its way to different regions, you're going to get a notification and the ability to, to sign up. See, we should do that. We, we, we had just like basic DSL, which yeah. was not fast. No. Uh, I think we Brutal. were one meg up, five megs down on not really, a good though. day. No. And you can't. That's what they say it's capable of yeah, up to. Yeah, but it's not. But you're looking 360 kilobits up. Uh, yeah, I like. Yeah. I turned on the internet and I almost heard that like. Oh. It was it was bad. <laughs> uh, so now we've got LTE, um, and it's costing us significantly more. And we're yeah. getting on a Gotta good day, we're yeah. 50 down, 25 up, oh, that's which good. is pretty yeah. decent. Mm -hmm. But because it's LTE, it's not as reliable for whatever reason. Yeah, and it probably our internet probably drops off three four times a day. And there's nothing worse than it dropping off in the middle of a service. When Do you have streaming. like a tower or something set up, or, or uh, are you just using the in, in built antenna? It's on the, the uh, built in antenna. They mm. rec recommended a tower, and it was on our list of things to do. Yeah. And then snow hit, and I'm like, I'm not going <laughs> on the roof. At the old studio, Studio D, uh, we had to use LTE right. for the same reason no internet in the area. That was a real oversight when we moved in there. Mm -hmm. um, but so, what I did to improve the performance was I got a modem um, that had the capability of having an external antenna. Yes, ours and, has that. And it has a BNC connector. And so, I ran a 50 foot BNC cable to the foyer where I set up a piece of PVC pipe yeah. with a Yagi antenna pointed at the tower. Now, I was fortunate because the tower was in line of sight from right. our front window. Now, in, in your case, you might have to I actually is. extend. Is it? Yeah. yeah, I think it is, at least from our Makes roof. a difference, man. If you use yeah. an external antenna that's directional and that you can point, because it's line of sight, right? Yeah. You're going to get the better signal if you got line of sight. If you're using the built-in antenna, 
you're going through walls, you're going oh, yeah. through everything to get there, and it's up and down, and the speed is kind of inconsistent depending on, you know, where you're standing and that kind of, you know, how sure. cell phone oh, yes. technology is, right? So, yeah. so grab one of those. They're not expensive. Yeah, it's like seventy-five bucks. Yeah, like you get the and then you get the mounting kit and you mount it. Uh, you can you can get a like a metal brace that can bolt onto the the side of the building. I'll just take it right to the top of the steeple. Oh, that would be brilliant. Yeah. yeah, that would look beautiful. You got a cross and a Yagi antenna. <laughs> 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 Hallelujah! <laughs> Good internet signal coming from that That's there right. church. <laughs> so maybe I'll go to Star Lake. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be the same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah there's true. all kinds of things you can do, and also LTE signal boosters. Yes, um, you can put those in line of the antenna as well, and that's going to increase the performance quite yeah. a bit. And again, these are all really Little affordable, things. easy, uh, easy technologies. Yeah, it's so just time. Yeah, time yeah. To do it. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been playing around with my 3D printer. Uh, it was running when I came in. It is running still. We can't hear it because it's in another room. I love Studio E, uh, but you mentioned when you came in. What was it? The first thing that you said. It was so quiet. So quiet. The Ender 3 V2 yeah. is like you hear the fan just like uh, like a like, like a like a server fan. Yeah. Like it's a little louder than your home computer, but but you haven't heard my home computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. It's All right. Old. Yeah, but uh, so it, yeah, it's it's running really really quiet, but I'm printing stuff, I'm printing some of my own inventions mm -hmm. and things that I've come up with, but the other thing I've been doing, Jeff, that has really proven to be another one of those things that's making me go, wow, this was a really good purchase, is Christmas gifts. Christmas Never gifts? Never thought of it in my life. What would you 3D print as a Christmas gift? I can't say it because the kids might be watching. Okay, fair. Okay, so give me an example. I'll show you in January. Like, okay. I'll just say, so there are some products that I can buy online. Yep. And I'll, I've got one particular product in mind that one... Pardon me, one of my children wanted. And it's forty dollars plus tax on Amazon. Right. Okay, so forty bucks. I mean, big deal. And typically I would just order it. But I thought, um, I'm gonna check. And I went on Thingiverse and I found the almost exact same thing really? in an STL file. I downloaded it and I printed it, and it cost sixty cents. And it is Fabulous! It's like really? it looks like a purchased product, and I've printed. I've been printing oh, like just anything I can think of. I'm, I'm saying to my wife now. I'm saying, Becca, a anything you can think of that I could possibly 3D print as Christmas gifts. And it's not hmm. to be. It's like it's not to be cheap. It's to be like we can make it ourselves. Well, sure, exactly. They want it. I can print it. Right. How fantastic is that? My kids keep telling me. Dad, will a 3D printer print us Lego blocks that we break? And I'm like, I have Oh no my idea. goodness, dude. There is a service that just, just went through the DMCA takedown. Really? But it's still available on GitHub. Okay. Because somebody forked it and it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> and it is mind blowing. You ask about Lego bricks. Yeah. And I'm not endorsing patent infringement or anything no. like that, but Lego is notoriously like the patent that, you know, it's like, it's, uh, how long is this thing going to go on for? Right. Um, you can, in this service, so it used to be a website service, now you have to download the program and run it. It's like a Python script. Okay. But in your browser, you can select not just Lego pieces, and it has all of the Lego pieces 3D printable. Really? You can actually select Lego kits. So, so you print the full kit. Mm-hmm. So you can say, okay, I want to print the uh, Millennium Falcon Lego kit, for example. So no you way. select it, and it gives you all the STL files that you're going to need and tells you the quantity of each part that you're going to need to print. See, that's cool. Un like, I mean, who... Who saw a DMCA takedown coming? Well, right? yeah, of course. Like that, as soon as I saw this service, I'm like, that. this guy is asking for trouble. Absolutely. <laughs> Big time. I mean, oh my well, goodness, that's risky. Now, does it go back to some of the retro Lego pieces? You know, I haven't dug into it that far, Jeff. Because there are some Lego, like we have uh, some Lego kits that are probably older than me. Yeah. And the pieces have broken. Oh sure, yeah. Uh, but you every can't, single piece you can you can find but it. But you in can't database. buy those pieces anymore, right? Because like they're specific yeah. to that set at the yeah. time. Yeah. It's like, 
Oh, I, I mean, they've got this one spaceship, and I've been trying to find this one piece. I've looked online, for, like different selling auction sites, everything. Yeah. <laughs> got the Lego, the like story. <laughs> this little piece. We don't provide that piece, and I'm like, oh, oh Jeff. So. so I'll just say yes, they are available. You right. can 3D print Lego bricks. I'm not going to say that I have. Right, fair but, enough. But I have. <laughs> and they are fully compatible. That's awesome. <laughs> and it That's works cool. fantastic. I mean, 3D printing, I, I, you're not doing that to infringe. You're not doing no. that to sell. You're not manufacturing the same kit that they're selling at the toy store. Yeah. It's just like, like you say, replacing a piece. Uh, in my case, I wanted to print something that is not possible like it's not something you can buy okay. um and i'll show it to you behind the scenes after the show and you'll be like oh yeah oh yeah this is cool this is cool so yeah what would you 3d print ah <sighs> so many cool things yeah. so many cool things hey um whether you're into 3d printing or linux or raspberry pi other single board computers whatever kind of tech you're into and even tech news we do a lot of that around here as well beck has been doing a fantastic job heading up the, job. the newsroom we've got crypto corner where we talk about cryptocurrency and our crypto correspondent uh robert koenig joins us every single week to talk about the latest trends in cryptocurrency and what's happening. And today we're going to be learning about uh, about the bull run that's happening right now with Bitcoin because yeah. the price is going up and up and up. And I looked Crazy. at my portfolio and I'm like, hmm, it's doing a little better than it was a week ago. Yeah. So we have all this content that is, you know, here and being offered free of charge. And we do this as a, a labor of love, we'll call it. But we, we absolutely love being here every week and providing this great content for you. Um, all we ask is, hey, please, if you enjoy the content, subscribe on YouTube. Click the like uh, on this video and let us know that you enjoy what we're doing. And uh, also click the bell so that you get the notifications whenever we are live, whenever we post new videos. Did you? I did. That's great. It's working. It is working. Awesome. YouTube works this week. That's fantastic. <laughs> it was funny last week. Um, so for those of you who watch live, you know, um, but YouTube actually had an outage yeah. last Wednesday night. Pretty so significant too. Yeah, it was, it was a global outage. But it was a weird one where anyone who was watching a video, it would stream fine. But if they refreshed or left the page or went to another video, all of a sudden they were getting errors. And, and so it was a pretty bad problem. Huh. Affected a lot of people. Think about how many people stream videos on YouTube. But we were broadcasting live at that time. We looked at the trends afterwards, uh, the, the downtime report. And YouTube's downtime was literally a spike at the very time that we were broadcasting. Not before and not after. Literally, it's as if, as soon as I pressed go, YouTube went down. So, really what we could say is just Cat5 so popular we broke YouTube. I would love to be able to say that, <laughs> Jeff. I really want to get that plaque. So, hey, we need more subscribers. Uh, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube, okay? But it was just like, of all the times for yes. it to go down, it can't go down at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday when, you know, I'm nowhere near YouTube. But, no, it had to happen during the live broadcast. Yeah. So, that was something else. <laughs> All right, this week we are going to be looking at the Raspberry Pi 400. It's a new kit from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Really excited about this little guy. Uh, and we're going to be looking at um, putting, we're going to put Ubuntu 20.10 on there because, as you may remember, Ubuntu Canonical are now officially supporting the Raspberry Pi right. as a platform th for Ubuntu. That's so that, that is a very huge deal. Um, that means it's going to be getting support from Canonical on a Raspberry Pi. It's no longer just a community thing or Sorry. you know, a hacky thing to try to get Ubuntu running on a, on a single board computer. No, they are actually supporting it and we're going to give it a try tonight to see how it operates. So like it. We've got to take a really quick break. When we come back, I'm going to get into this box. Stick around. <laughs> We 
We've all heard of the Raspberry Pi. It's a single board computer and about a, well, a little more than a year ago they released the Raspberry Pi 4. Mm -hmm. And the Raspberry Pi 4 is kind of a revolutionary addition to, um, to the lineup because up until the Raspberry Pi 4, Raspberry Pi was a great tinkering board. It was something that's a lot of fun for makers and tinkerers and, and you know people that just want to get their hands wet as far as setting up a, a single board computer. I still have my retro gaming on it. Hey, there you go. Retro Pi does retro very, Pi very well. Phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but with the Raspberry Pi 4, of course, it brought it into more of a, hey, this is almost as good as a you know entry level desktop computer mm -hmm. on a single board computer. So with that said, if you can use a single board computer in place of a desktop computer, what's next? Right? So you could do that. And I want to, you know, I want to be brutally honest with you. I mean, it, it's a single board computer still through and through. Absolutely. But we're talking like it might have four or eight gigs of RAM, which is really good for a single board computer. It's, it um, makes for a decent, like, Office processor. It, that's exactly right. Yeah, like if you're just using it to, to get online, do your Facebook and do your social media. It's phenomenal. Watch the occasional video online. It's good for that too, as long as you've got the right setup. Yeah. Um, but I think that's where people get hung up with these types of boards is that they're not built for multimedia, or at least they're not well support. At least there's not a great deal of support for multimedia yet. Correct. You talk about retro gaming, and retro gaming does really, really well because it's based on technology from 10, 15 years ago. That's right. So it does very well on a Raspberry Pi, but yes. it hasn't caught up to things like, like you're not going to get really good performing video. Although, that said, the Raspberry Pi 4 does have some really incredible specifications, including dual 4K 60p video output, yep. micro HDMI granted. Right. So, you know, but that's... I mean, it even does well with photo graphics. Like I've got GIMP yeah. on my Raspberry Pi. There you go. Yeah. And it works great for that. As long as you don't exceed the amount of RAM. So a well, Raspberry yeah. Pi, the earlier gens that had only one gig of RAM, yeah. you may have trouble if you open a 30 gig <laughs> file, <laughs> right? right? Like you're not going to be doing video editing in 4K, that's yeah. for sure. But yeah, GIMP doing some JPEG work or something totally like that. Works. Why not? Absolutely. Yeah. So now the natural evolution of that kind of desktop idea, taking a Raspberry Pi single board computer and turning it into a desktop computer has evolved into what's called the Raspberry Pi 400. So it is a Raspberry Pi 4 at its heart. It's been, you know, the, they've rearranged the board in order to make it fit within this chassis. Right. And, you know, it, it takes me back to the kind of mid 80s, um, I guess when I had a VIC-20, which was a keyboard yes. computer. That's and, right. And, and like that was one of my first computers. And wow. you know, you think about the Amiga, the Commodores, and yeah. those things that we grew up with are kind of, you know, people have wanted that. There have been projects where people can 3D print their own Raspberry Pi keyboard case and things like that. But now it's official, it's sleek, it's, incredible. It's a little bit um, gimmicky in a way, but yeah, if you, you look want, past that. I think so. I think so. We're going to kind of figure that out together tonight. Um, if you're into that like really sleek form factor, it is literally a keyboard that is the computer. If you don't mind the fact that it's got some cables coming out of it and, uh, and you've got to set a monitor up, then you're going to do just fine with this. But it's not like the Raspberry Pi that you'll stick on the back of a TV and it just operates hidden away. This is going to be on your desk. Do you remember the desk in your garage that you were turning into a computer? I remember that. This is like that, but smaller. This is a lot sleeker. <laughs> that desk so was So I had huge. taken a, a big old oak desk and uh, converted it into a full ATX computer. Yeah. Yeah, back in the day. I was that, so jealous of that desk. That was pretty cool. When it we was used cool. to do LAN parties and stuff, Unreal Tournament Good on times. a desk. Good times. But let's get into the box. I want to take a look at this and see what we have with the Raspberry Pi 400. First thing we're going to see is da, 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 the Raspberry Pi 400. So that is a Raspberry Pi 4 single board computer with 4 gigs of RAM ready to go built in to the keyboard. It's just like the Raspberry Pi keyboard. Now I've got the ANSI edition, so US keyboard layout. 
Uh, let's take a look at the back here. We've got full-size GPIO. Wow. Labeled with pins 1 and 40. We've got micro SD, dual HDMI output, USB-C for the power, dual uh, USB 3 and a USB 2, and Ethernet gigabit, and a Kensington lock. So, and yes, oh. that, and that is uh, gigabit Ethernet. Yeah, you need a Ke Kensington lock on your Raspberry Pi. Come on. <laughs> Just another cable to have. Uh, all right. It also, this is the kit, of course. So it comes with some extra things to get you up and going. Comes with the official Raspberry Pi mouse. There it is. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, it looks like a pretty generic cheap mouse. I wish it, I wish it was wireless, to be honest with you. I think that would have been a lot better for them to do that, but hey, I agree. it came with it. Uh, we got the power supply, USB-C, uh, and that, of course, uh, is 5.1 volts, 3 amps, and that's going to power this bad boy. We've got a SD card to micro SD adapter. I guess the SD card, yeah, that, it's actually in the Raspberry Pi 400. Oh, okay. So presumably that is ready to boot. Further in the box, ah, we've got a micro HDMI to HDMI cable. I love that. So we don't have a bunch of dongles and adapters hanging out the back of it. It is just a nice little sleek cable. Uh, and it came with this beginner's guide as well, which is, you know, a wow. good $15 book right there uh, included, which has got tons of projects for the kids. If you want to get into some STEM stuff, um, some fun projects to get you up and going and, and doing some maker tech, um, this is a, a, a pretty incredible addition, really. I mean, you typically want to buy that separately. So nice that it came with it anyways. Yeah. There you go. So love the keyboard layout. It does not feel like a, a bad keyboard at all. I mean, it, it, they're pretty low profile keys. You're not look, looking at a mechanical keyboard. It's more like a kind of like a laptop keyboard or something like that. Yeah, but they're not clunky, which is nice. Yeah. The cooling on the bottom there is uh, quite significant. Uh, there's a really large heat sink in there that's keeping the thing cool. So they've overclocked it to 1.8 gigahertz out of the box. Oh, cool. Uh, which is lovely. And as you can see, just sleek form factor. So it's even smaller than my VIC-20, but super, <laughs> super powerful. And what, I, I, it's, I not, it it's not that thick either, which is No, nice. that's what I mean. Like sleek form factor, just great. Eh? I would have thought, because I mean, you're used to the Raspberry Pi, you know, it sits up that high. I thought it was going to be a much bigger keyboard, but no, they've really, no. they've really shrunk it down. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just like a Raspberry Pi 4, you've got Bluetooth 5, you've got your uh, Wi-Fi, gigabit Ethernet. Um, I'm going to be using it on Wi-Fi today. Um, and it just fires right up and ready to go. So should we do that? Absolutely. Let's fire it up. Well, here we are. Raspberry Pi OS came pre-installed. Um, at first boot, I had to just kind of go through the initial setup process, which just got its updates and things like that. Um, I'm going to connect to my, you know, I, I can connect to Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is working out of the box. Um, everything just kind of works just like a Raspberry Pi. What does it come with? I mean, you've got everything that comes on a Raspberry Pi OS. Games. Noise. Minecraft Pi, Boing, Bunner. So what's the performance like? Oh, there we go. Oh, that was quick. Oh, oh, that you, was quick. The, yeah. You are not good at that. <laughs> not very good at that. Um, that's okay. So, I mean, performance-wise, it's a Raspberry Pi 4. It performs really great. It's, uh, it's all running from this little keyboard. So what do I have? I've got the uh, mouse cable, I've got power, and I've got HDMI output going to the TV. And that's all there is to it. So um, the SD card that came in it, again, came pre-installed with this operating system, ready to go overclock to 1.8 gigahertz. Um, I would rather have seen them put in better SD cards, truthfully. Um, so I actually, I grabbed myself a Kingston Endurance card. I think because Raspberry Pis are known to eat micro SD cards for dinner, um, I want something that's going to be a little more, um, you know, long life, better for this kind of thing. So I'm going to shut this down because 
I'm probably not going to want to personally run Raspberry Pi OS on here. I want to run Ubuntu because now Ubuntu is officially supported on the Raspberry Pi 4. This being a Raspberry Pi 4, it, at its heart, it should run pretty well. We got four gigs of RAM and uh, I've already pre-installed Ubuntu 12.10 from Ubuntu.com. It's now officially downloadable as an image file from their website. If you click on downloads, you're going to see under uh, IoT, Raspberry Pi is the first in the list. Um, so we're going to shut her down, take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be booted into Ubuntu 20.10. Stick around. Welcome back. So we are booted into Ubuntu 20.10 on the Raspberry Pi 400. So this keyboard is all that I need in order to be up and running with a full computer. And here we go. Out of the box, it's got Firefox and uh, let's bring it up. I have, you know, I've tested a few things just to see how things work. I've connected it to the TV at home just to see, you know, are the videos going to work and things like that. Let's make sure that I have internet because I should have yeah I've already got I've already set up my Wi-Fi which is configurable just like on Ubuntu you just go to your Wi-Fi settings here and select your network and there you go enter your password and you're in um, let's jump on to YouTube because I mean the the question that always comes up is immediately how does it handle multimedia we know that it's got your office suite we've got LibreOffice writer LibreOffice, the suite already pre-installed with Ubuntu. Um, so if I click on that, there we go, LibreOffice Writer, just like you would expect. So, I mean, that's never a question. Is Office going to work? Yeah, it's going to work out of the box. But what about things like YouTube? So let's go to linuxtechshow.com, which is going to reroute to our Linux Tech Show uh, channel on YouTube. Make sure you give us a subscribe. And here we go. Let's click on Becca's news from last week. And everything seems to load pretty well. The ads work, so that's good. Now I'm monetizing this, so this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Video will play after ad. This is great TV. So if you got an ad while you're watching this, and now you're watching me watch an ad. We basically just doubled our monetization this week. So that's been <laughs> fantastic. Uh, OK, so there's Becca in a YouTube video. Let's bring it up full screen and see how that performs, because that's usually problematic on these kinds of setups. But as you can see, out of the box in Firefox, it's working fantastic. Uh, frame rate seems OK. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how to gauge that beyond what I see, and it, it looks fine. Yeah, looking uh, smooth. Yeah. So YouTube works. The other thing that I wanted to know is, was Plex going to work? So, and I don't know if I'm going to have access to it from here, because as I mentioned, I was able to access it from my home TV. And I'll just say, uh, out of the box, Plex did not work. So it said that there was some kind of error or something missing. And I got into some forums, and I, and I started looking through and somebody suggested, oh, just install the VLC package. And I'm like, just like everyone else in the thread, they're like, how does that impact Plex? Because VLC is a video player, but it has nothing at all to do with Plex. Well, it turns out, so I just did an apt install Plex, or pardon me, uh, VLC. And uh, having installed VLC, it brought in all these codecs and everything else that come with VLC and Plex worked at that point. So everything worked absolutely flawlessly. So now we're able to watch things. And in fact, I was able to decode H.265 video on Plex. Oh, nice. Which was fantastic, because even my, my computer that's connected to the TV at home has a great deal of trouble with H.265. Um, H.265 is very resource intensive. I prefer to keep my media at H.264. So just keep in mind, 
if you're looking for the best performance on this, you're probably going to want to stick with H.264, but it did play H.265. I'd probably go with Ethernet, though, because as you know, Wi-Fi with H.265 is probably going to have some hiccups. Um, that works great. The one thing that I have not yet got to work, Jeff and, and community, is Netflix, because the version of Firefox that comes with this does not support DRM on, and Netflix requires that. So there are packages, and you get into the forums on the Raspberry Pi, uh, because remember, this is a Raspberry Pi 4, right? So lots of people have already put work into it, and there are installers, which I haven't tried yet, but the forum threads say that, hey, you can install this script, and it will, um, it will get you up and running with a version of Chrome that is built for uh, DRM. So then you can use things like Netflix, which require that. So everything works pretty good out of the box. Pretty nice, right? Yeah. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, is this a gaming system? No. Is this a multimedia system? No, not really. Um, but I'll say we use um, an Android box at home for our TV. And I disconnected that and plugged this in in its place. And this was performing better than our one-year-old uh, oh, really? Android box. Yeah, so for multimedia even, it was doing a better job than the Android box. And I think that the, the family can really appreciate it a little more because uh, the form, like the kind of the, the way that it, the, I guess the desktop paradigm is more like a computer than an Android TV. So you're actually using an interface that where you're bringing up a browser and you're able to install applications and Linux software and things like that. So it is a really robust system. Works great. Um, I mean, that's, that's really all there is to it, right? Like, does it work? Yeah. It is a Raspberry Pi 4, though. So if I was going to use this as a set-top box, I would just go with a Raspberry Pi 4, right. overclock it to 1.8 gigahertz to, to match the speed of this. Um, and, and that's not really a selling point. Remember that overclocking can be done anyways. So whether you have a Raspberry Pi 4 at 1.5 gigahertz or a Raspberry Pi 400 at, at 1.8, it looks like a selling p feature on paper. But it's just a setting in the operating system. So you can take that Raspberry Pi 4 and bump it up to 1.8 as well. So uh, pretty clever marketing, I must say, because those who don't understand how overclocking works will think this is faster. Well, it's not. Uh, it's the exact same uh, SOC. So all right, let's jump back over. So I mean, all in all, I'm pretty impressed with it. I yeah. like it. As I mentioned, it's a little bit on the gimmicky side, but I'm old school, and I like that kind of a gimmick. Well, and I mean, for, for me, like I'm looking at that and I'm going, that would make, especially with this, you know, manual, Yeah. that would make a great Christmas gift yeah. for the kids because like our, our, especially with, you know, one of my boys who really wants to get into programming. Mm -hmm. Savannah has been doing that for a couple of years, going back to that, uh, the Siggy that she had, yep. uh, from smart girls. Yeah. This is a robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I mean, something like that, that would be cool. You know, yeah. buy them a monitor and a, and a, you know, the, the Raspberry Pi Yeah, just connect it to the TV. Well, yeah, you can do and, that and too. And that's the nice thing too, is that it, because of the form factor, you can just disconnect it and put it away when you're not using it, pull it out, put it on the, on the TV, whatever you want to do. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it's definitely got its place. Yes. Um, is it for you? That's really, you know, it's a case by case thing. So, uh, but I've taken a look at it. I like it. Um, I think it's, it's actually making a really nice kiosk here at the studio. I think yeah. we, we may just Great. keep it set up. Um, pretty fantastic. So check it out. It's the Raspberry Pi 400. I'll post links below for you and uh, follow those. Um, and I'll, uh, that will probably kick back a little bit to help the show. But otherwise, just you know, grab yourself one in time for Christmas if you think it would make a great gift. We've got to head over to the newsroom. Becca's standing by. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Microsoft is warning users to opt for MFA that doesn't use SMS or voice to authenticate. Apple has revealed its first Mac computers powered by chips of its own design. Alphabet plans to beam internet wirelessly using light. Ubuntu has fixed a handful of bugs that standard users could use to become root. And Google is dropping the photos free storage. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. 
Microsoft is urging users to abandon telephone-based multi-factor authentication solutions like one-time codes sent via SMS and voice calls. The warning comes from Alex Weiner, Director of Identity Security at Microsoft. For the past year, Weiner has been advocating on Microsoft, Microsoft's behalf, urging users to embrace and enable MFA for their online accounts. Citing internal Microsoft statistics, Weinert said in a blog post last year that users who enabled multi-factor authentication ended up blocking around 99.9% .9 of automated attacks against their Microsoft accounts. But in a follow-up blog post last Thursday, Weinert says that if users have to choose between multiple MFA solutions, they should stay away from telephone-based MFA. The Microsoft exec cites several known security issues not with MFA, but with the state of the telephone networks today. Weinart says that both SMS and voice calls are transmitted in clear text and can be easily intercepted by determined attackers using readily available techniques and tools. SMS-based one-time codes are also fishable via open source tools like Modishka, Cred Sniper, or Evil's Jinx. There's another issue with SMS-based multi-factor authentication that we talked about back on episode 570 when an AT&T kiosk employee was responsible for a SIM swap that resulted in $240 million in Bitcoin being stolen from a customer. Phone network employees can be tricked into transferring phone numbers to a threat actor's SIM card, allowing attackers to receive MFA one-time codes on behalf of their victims. On top of these, phone networks are also exposed to changing regulations, downtimes and performance issues, all of which impact the availability of the MFA mechanism overall, which in turn prevents users from authenticating on their account in moments of urgency. Weinart says that all of these factors combined demonstrate that SMS and call-based MFA is the least secure of the MFA methods available today. An excellent solution is to switch to an app-based authenticator, or for the absolute best security, security available, you should go with hardware security keys, which Weinhardt ranked as the best MFA solution in a blog post he published last year. Multi-factor authentication is huge on lots of subscription websites, but I found lately, you know, in my line of work, because I'm setting up a ton of accounts everywhere, mm -hmm. so many of them will not allow some of those higher end security options. It's basically an email oh. or cell phone through that SMS text. <clears throat> and some of them, they only allow the SMS. So, I mean, I love the idea, but until the industry changes, how do you fill that gap? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to note that SMS is still safer than no multi-factor authentication. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it's a, a case where, like I think about Payoneer, for example, who just this past year introduced MFA. Mm -hmm. And it's the same kind of thing. It's SMS-based or email-based even. Yeah. Um, even ConnectWise uses email-based authentication. And while that is a little better, I guess email, it's not great. No. Not great at all. Especially with the amount of email accounts that are hacked. Absolutely. And, and it goes to show, I mean, from a security perspective, um, you think about, okay, well, if my email gets hacked, now they actually have access to your multi-factor authentication as well, if Sorry. you're using email-based multi-factor authentication. But uh, SIM card swaps are very, very frightening in that yep. it can be done very, very easily. Absolutely. I mean, if, if an AT&T um, kiosk worker can make a mistake and believe that you are who you say you are, Maybe you've got fake ID. Maybe you That's present, right. uh, like you just you just got to be convincing. It's social engineering at its best, right there. Oh, it's totally walking up to the kiosk and saying, "Yeah, I'm Jeff Weston. Me, I'm not Jeff Weston. He is. If I said I'm Jeff Weston, I needed a, I've lost my phone. I needed to activate it on my new phone, and they fall for it. Then guess what? <laughs> now I've got all your SMS. What if the person who works at the kiosk was a malicious party? What if the person who works there who has the authority and ability to sim swap on accident through social engineering what if they were the bad guy yep now all of a sudden that takes a whole new spin doesn't it because you know what kind of credentials do i need to get hired at a mall kiosk so is no offense to anyone who works in a mall kiosk no, no, of course not. i don't mean that yeah. i mean like it's not like you have probably gone through an unbelievable amount of security checks and you know that kind of stuff so right. that's what i mean
what if, I know of some people that instead of using their cell phone, they'll download like uh, an app that gives them a yeah. cell phone number. You mentioned the Magic Jack app. Yeah, example. like you can get yep. Magic Jack and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So would that be a suitable alternative? That way it's not going through your SIM, it's actually through data. As long as it's a trusted source. Do you have multi-factor authentication on your Magic Jack app? Well, but you'd use your cell phone. So you, like, yeah. you, you'd use the number that you have. Like I could download the Magic Jack app, get a, get a number, and then I could plunk that into all my services saying, this is my right. number. But can't I then compromise your number? I don't know. That's what I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm asking. I would imagine that, so. Would that be an alternative that bypasses the SIM product, uh, problem? In a way. But it's still going through SMS, so it's still plain text. So somebody with enough knowledge and enough um, who knows how you're doing things. I mean, every viewer, because you mentioned the Magic Jack app, and, right. and I bring it up again, but because you mentioned it on the air, every viewer knows that that's what you're using. Right. So now, you know, any viewer that has that kind of knowledge could easily enough, <laughs> you know, if, if they get a hold of your Magic Jack number, then they can start doing a brute force on the password because your Magic Jack account doesn't have two-factor authentication on the website, right? All right, I'm just going to have to go it's with ro rotary phone authentication. <laughs> <laughs> Still better than nothing. Still better than nothing. Wow. Apple has unveiled the first Mac computers powered by its own M1 chip. In June, the company announced it would transition away from the Intel processors it had used since 2006. Apple said the advantages of using the M1 chip included better battery life, instant wake from sleep mode, and the ability to run iOS apps. It added it had optimized all of its own map apps, but now needs to convince other developers to do likewise. The new computers include new versions of the 13-inch MacBook Air, which no longer requires a fan to keep its processor cool. The 13-inch MacBook Pro also will also receive the new processor, and Apple says it can now play video for 20 hours on a single charge, twice as long as before. The Mac Mini will also receive the M1. It did not unveil new versions of its iMac or Mac Pro computers, suggesting Apple might be waiting for more advanced versions of the chip with more memory and greater graphics processing capabilities to use in those. The new Macs are available immediately. They run the new Mac OS Big Sur operating system. An Alphabet-backed wireless network in Kenya plans to use light beams to provide internet service up to 20 kilometers away. The technology will deliver wireless internet over light beams that can cover distances of up to 20 kilometers. Alphabet's project Tara, which was unveiled in 2017 under the name the FSOC Project, conducted a series of pilots in Kenya last year and is now partnering with a telecom company to deliver internet access in remote parts of Africa. Kenya will get the technology first with other countries in sub-Saharan Africa to follow. Similar to fiber optic cables, Tara's technology uses light to transmit data, but without the cables. The technology requires line of sight connections, so Alphabet deploys the terminals high up on towers, poles, or rooftops. Tara uses light to transmit information at speeds as high as 20 gigabits per second as a very narrow invisible beam. The concept grew out of Project Loon, which had developed a balloon-based network to cover remote areas. Alphabet explains the Loon team needed to figure out a way to create a data link between balloons and were and were flying over 100 kilometers uh, sorry that were flying over 100 kilometers apart and thus investigated the use of free space optical communications technology to establish high throughput links between balloons after using those links to send data between balloons in the stratosphere, Loon engineers wondered if they could apply some of that science to solve connect connectivity problems down a little closer to Earth, and Project Tara was born. Tara's links will begin rolling out across liquid telecoms networks in Kenya first and will provide, help provide high-speed connectivity in places where it's challenging to lay fiber cables or where deploying fiber might be too costly or dangerous. Ubuntu has fixed a handful of bugs that standard users can use to become root, and Google is dropping the photos free storage. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert is here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to the world of cryptos and welcome back to the Crypto Corner. Today we're going to take a journey back in history. And why? Because things are looking pretty good at the moment in regards to pricing uh, and cryptocurrencies. If we look into uh, what the market is currently doing by the time I'm recording this year, Bitcoin is at $17,520, went up by 14% in seven days. But as you can see, most coins are behaving quite uh, quite positively, let's say it that way. And so that you don't take any wrong decision because there are a lot of people having an opinion out there. And also, if you look into the press, so this is Cointelegraph, um, Bitcoin up 375% since Peter Schiff accidentally called the exact bottom. Peter Schiff is somebody that is a gold uh, bug. He hates Bitcoin, but he loves his gold. So he's an old guy. Um, uh, the reasons why Bitcoin hit uh, $17,000. Uh, somebody predicts here, Novogratz, Mike Novogratz predicted 65000 the price of Bitcoin. Then we had some bankers, uh, Citigroup, predicting the price will be at uh, 316000 We've got here a Bitcoin analyst gives four reasons why BTC price will hit 22000 next. So you'll be hearing that from many other sources too. And uh, that's why I would like to take you back in history. But as said, this is not going to be financial advice, yeah? just to be clear on this here. So this is just to show you what happened in the past and why, because I've been living through this year already four times. So let's go back. This is CoinGecko and I, look, I clicked on the Bitcoin price and went back to 2018, December 2018. And as you can see, uh, this is the bull market we lived through the last time. Yeah? So it went up from uh, around $800-$600 to $20,000. Uh, All-time high was at that time around uh, $19,665. And if we look into the numbers, so this is the numbers, so this is coin market cap. Um, they did a historical snapshot, 10th of December 2017. Bitcoin went up in seven days, 34%. Most of the other coins, as you can see, are in red, so they went down. Uh, so there was no correlation at that time that significant between when the bull market start, really starts between Bitcoin and the other coins. So Bitcoin was at 15,000 and Ethereum at 440. IOTA, somebody, uh, that coin is probably not even under the 20, top 20 any longer, is it four, was at $4. One week later, only one week later, seven days later, Bitcoin was close to its all-time high, 19,000. Ethereum almost doubled in that week. Um, IOTA went a little bit down, 8%, but you see here others like Cardano went up 360%, Litecoin 110% in one week. Yeah, so this is thing when things go really, really crazy. A week later, Bitcoin went already down, so it was 19,000 the all time high, and now we're 16,400, so this is on the 7th of January. But other coins like here, Ethereum, continued going up. Yeah, so not even close to its all-time high. I think the all-time high was around 1,400 for Ethereum. Cardano, $1. So, um, yeah, other coins were still growing significantly while Bitcoin was going down because people were thinking, hmm, Bitcoin is going down, so let's invest, invest in those old coins and make a lot of money that way. So you have to be really, really careful on where you're investing, what you do. So do your research, be very calm in, in what you're doing. And uh, what I find encouraging at the moment is that this bull market that we're currently living through, I mean, as you saw, after the bull market will come a true retracement. And in cryptocurrencies, that will be around 20 to 30%. You can expect that. But what I find encouraging is if you look at Google Trends, so people that are searching for the word Bitcoin, for example, on a global basis, in 2018, that was 100%, equivalent to 100%. At the moment, we're only at 11, 10-11%. So not a lot of people outside of our little industry are talking about cryptocurrencies. Just imagine this thing goes out in the press and everybody starts talking to you about Bitcoin. Yeah. So if your aunt uh, Emma comes to you and asks you about this weird stuff called Bitcoin or your cab driver tells you that the best uh, thing to invest in is Bitcoin, then you know that we're getting near a top. Um, but this is just a guess. I'm not an expert. This is what happened in 2017, looking at the at the data on how that was um, last time. So that's um, that's the journey that I wanted to show you, so that you uh, take the right decision. 
um, so stay calm when these things happen. Don't uh, don't overstretch yourself, and just listen to the market very carefully. I mean, this is the third time, as I mentioned, that I'm running through this year. The first two times were identical. Yeah, you had these these crocodile teeth where it went up by fifty percent and down by twenty percent in 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 a week. And then we had, um, and I, I also, both times I was not able to read the top market. So I, I miscalculated that one too, as I guess most of the people. Anyway, that's it from me. Please leave us a like. It helps us um, to spread the word. And as always, I thank you very much for watching. It's, um, I'm really looking forward to see you next week again. So thank you. And until then, bye-bye. Thanks, Robert. No word yet if Turtle Coin has gone to the moon. I still have my Turtle Coin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your one turtle coin? No, I've thought, geez, I think I got like 500,000 or something. Yeah, wow. That's worth about $3 now. Uh, hey, you know what? 500,000 of them. Is. Slow and steady wins the race. I learned that, that? turtle in the hair. <laughs> so, <laughs> Speaking of altcoins, yeah, a lot. Like it's amazing what's going on. But uh, just want to remind you that we're not actually providing financial advice. We're just sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market and having a lot of fun while we do it. Um, always remember, cryptocurrency is ever-changing, as we're seeing here uh, on the show. Uh, with those trends, it's up, it's down, and it's always changing, and it's always volatile. So only invest what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Ubuntu has fixed a handful of bugs that standard users could use to become root. Ubuntu developers have fixed a series of vulnerabilities that made it easy for standard users to gain coveted root privileges. Kevin Backhouse, a researcher at GitHub, wrote in a post published last Tuesday, with a few simple commands in the terminal and a few mouse clicks, a standard user can create an administrator account for themselves. The first series of commands triggered a denial of service bug in daemons used to manage user accounts on the computer. When done correctly, Ubuntu would restart and open a window that allowed the user to create a new account that had root privileges. This is the setup screen that you would normally see when you're installing Ubuntu for the first time. It means that Junior is able to create a new user account for himself, and this time it's going to be an administrator account. All done. So now he just has to wait a few more seconds and he's in. Here he's going to quickly open a terminal again so that he can run ID to show that the new account called Indiana is an administrator account. So there you can see that Indiana is in the pseudo group which means that he's an administrator. The second bug involved in the hack resided in the GNOME Display Manager which among other things manages user sessions and the login screen. The Display Manager also triggers the initial setup of the OS when it detects no users currently exist. Since it verifies whether an account exists or not by asking Accounts Daemon, if that daemon is locked up, it will think there are no accounts. The vulnerabilities could be triggered only when someone had access to and a valid account on a vulnerable machine. It worked only on desktop versions of Ubuntu. Maintainers of the op open source Ubuntu OS patched the bugs last week. Google Photos will soon count against your overall Google account storage space, which will mean fees if you exceed 15 gigabytes. Google's popular photo service is used by over a billion people, with 28 billion new photos and videos uploaded to the surface every week, and until now it has offered free storage for your photos. But Google says it will stop offering the free storage model within Google Photos on June 1, 2021. Instead, Google says any new photos and videos you upload will count toward the free 15 gigabytes of storage that comes with every Google account, or for those of us who require more space, additional storage may be purchased. Presumably, this means Google Photos will become part of the standard Google account storage billing model, which gives each user 15 gigabytes free for Drive, Gmail, and other services. So going forward, your photos will also take up storage within the limits of that account. There is some good news though, the change is not retroactive. This means photos already in the free Google Photos storage will remain free. So no fears of your Google bill suddenly including the terabyte of photos you posted of your cat while in quarantine. But moving forward, all photos you add will count against your overall Google account's limits and therefore could affect your monthly fees. And now for a little Google favoritism, 
users of Google's Pixel lineup of smartphones are completely exempt from the change and will continue to receive the service free of charge. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Well, we're almost out of time, but one final thing to talk about. Just a real quick tip for you. Okay. A new feature in Google Assistant on your Android phone is blowing my mind and has already proved itself to be very, very useful. See, I don't use my Google Assistant. So Neither I'm do I. I'm interested to see what this I is. I don't use it normally. However, we've all got it on our Android phone, and this feature is available to you. Now, similar features are available in apps and have been, uh, has been available for quite some time. However, they've really nailed it as far as the quality and the ability to use this service. It's called, what's that song? What's this song? Oh, so it's like, what was it, Shazam years yeah. ago? Yeah, but this really, really works. So should we try it? Sure. What's this song? It can be that bad. So you can hum it. Oh my goodness. And it actually works. And I've used it, I've, I've held it up to my computer speaker when there was a video playing, and, and I, it just had like a really cool backing track or something, and it gave me the song. So where does it pull the repository of information from? Google. I'm wondering, could you train Google to recognize the Cat5 theme song? Oh, well, let's work on that. <laughs> I think you should. It, it works really, really well. All you have to do is just ask Assistant, what's this song? You can hmm. play something to the microphone from a speaker. You can hum it. You can hold it up to a, a radio, whatever it takes. Um, somebody on, uh, on Twitter was saying, I can't remember who sings such and such a song. And so I sang it into it, just the, the hook, yep. and really, really miserably. And it, sure enough, gave me the, uh, the original huh. singer and gives you the, the cover art and everything. Wow. How amazing is that? And hmm. I wasn't even good enough to breach copyright there. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, Google recognized what the song was. Right. Yes, it did. How cool is that? Very, very, cool. very useful, especially when you hear a song on the radio and the DJ, because DJs are the worst, Jeff. <laughs> You ever notice that? DJs never tell you the name of the song? I always said the name of the song. Hey, I, I was listening, and all right, a PSA. No, I always mentioned the song. Never. I, I always <laughs> did. Because it drove me nuts to not know the song. Yes, but now the DJ is out of a job because I can just ask Google Assistant. How cool. That is officially all the time that we have this week, folks. It's been great having you here. Thank you for joining us. A reminder that you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash category5. Great way to support the content that we create. We give it away for free, but if you've got means to support that free content, it means the world to us and it allows us, it gives us the resources that we need in order to keep this thing going and get stronger and stronger every week. So we appreciate and thank you very much for your support. Mm -hmm. Have a great week, everybody. See ya. Bye.